when foot and mouth hit, I mean, I look back in my in my vet school notes, which I'd kept, last year in the 1960s, if seen, call a policeman. You tell me that something was said in this podcast that wasn't factually mm-hmm. correct. This is a first. Un- <laughs> this <laughs> is unprecedented. Uh, <laughs> like, let's give you a hard time. <laughs> Why? Why am I only getting £3.40 a kilo for my lambs? What, what are you doing? <laughs> I've been Cami. I've been Iona. And we are both Fed by, by farmers. farmers. Hello and welcome to the Fed by Farmers podcast with me, Cami Wilson. And me, Iona Murray. We are back with another interview every Tuesday, of course, 7am we put them out, UK time. This week we have Kate Rill from QMS. Yep. A really good one. And I, listen, guys... Before we even start here, I really get stuck into Oh, you do. About why we are not getting four pounds a kilo for our lambs. It's sticking at three pound oh, ninety. And it's ridiculous. It's been ages. Now. I know, I know it's a joke. It's, it is an absolute what joke. are they doing in there? Uh, what what do we pay our levies for? We did ask when, that. When question. lambs are only averaging 180 pounds a head, <laughs> it's a disgrace. It's wild. But we get into that. We do. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> of course, as always. Who do we need to thank? Oh, Crystal X and Animax every time. Yes, and I, you know, we always give Trace Sure boluses a shout out for Animax, but they also have, I think it's called Easy Cal. Now, it's it's okay. in my latest or one of my most recent YouTube videos. I had a you doing with Twin Lamb. Mm-hmm. Went and got this Easy Cal stuff. It's like a little bottle that comes with a applicator on the top. Okay. And you just squeeze it in our mouth rather than injecting the calcium. And apparently oral calcium, given calcium orally, mm-hmm is quite an effective way of doing it. And certainly the two years that we had done, it got them back up on their feet. So they were down with twin lamb and it, it seems to have done the job. So yeah, do check out. I mean, you're, you're too busy lambing to be both and just now, but think about that easy cal as an option to have in yeah. the shed. Actually really handy to keep on the bike. Mm-hmm. And I use the bottles for administering uh, my version of Yugo, which is like a keto soul stuff we got from the vet, which is like a high energy glucose drink. Right. So because it's such a handy little dose bottle. Perfect. You can fill the bottle again with that, mm-hmm. ready to go. So if you have a you doing, boom. You do you doing you go. There you go. There you go. Perfect. So yes, thanks very much to them for sponsoring the podcast. More on that a little bit later. We've got some new audio things they've sent us actually just to jazz it up a bit. Yes, yeah, all that. Good to mix it up, ready for turnout. What have you been doing this week? We have started lambing. Mm. Full swing. Can tell looking at you. I know, I know we should touch on that. I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't planning on being filmed today. Uh, no, but for anyone <laughs> for anyone sitting down <laughs> if I had a pound. If for anyone sitting down uh, watching it on YouTube, like Iona goes, Oh, can't believe I'm going on camera like this. You look exactly the same to me. <laughs> Do I? Yeah, maybe your hair a bit less yeah. brushed, but Oh, I was in the rain, got caught in the rain this morning. Oh yeah. My yeah. Fa- no, do you not see a difference? Not really. No. Okay. Are you getting a bit windburn? Yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm rosy. I get really, really rosy cheeks. Yeah, okay. We're hiding them well. What, how is lambing going at your end? Um, mixed. I think you always get that wee bit at the start where it just feels like it, all it is is death. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're just powering on through that right now. Um, but I. That, that's exactly where I am just now. Is it? Yeah, four triplets, 12 dead lambs, and two dead Jews. That's so, that is so destroying. Good it start. Is. Mm. But I do, I say that to dad at the very beginning and the very end, it's always the same. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. Especially, I mean, the end, the end almost sometimes it's complacency that gets the better of you because, you know, you get a hung lamb that you think, oh, and yeah. uh, you get caught out with things at the end because you have been at it so long. Mm. But at the start, when, you know, we're all, do you, I don't even know if I feel excited this year. I feel nervous. Not. I feel quite nervous. But then you're doing things a bit differently this year think, as well. Yeah. I think that's what it is. Yeah. But I know tomorrow I'll get into it and I'll be away. Yeah, and we'll be vlogging, and the sun won't be shining, <laughs> but we'll get there. We'll yeah, get there. we will. But anyway, that's enough about our woes. Let's hear from Kate Rowell. As we said, she is here representing QMS, but also representing herself. We hear a bit about her story. Mm-hmm. She's she was a a vet, a farm vet. She's a farmer in her own right as well, and she now travels all over the place promoting. Scotch produce, Scotch Scotch red meat, I think is yeah, the correct. Yeah, so QMS term. is Quality Meat Scotland. Yes, um, um, and she represents that, and and it's interesting to to hear one why we're getting a premium for our lambs and our, our beef mm-hmm. at the moment, and you know where where she thinks that's heading in the future. So let's roll the VT. You you do it this time. I always do it. Okay. <laughs> now I got all I can think of it is only saying those words. <laughs> you put your own spin on it. This is this podcast we started. I'm using all this. <laughs> no, you're not. 
Hi, Kate. How are you? Hello, I am fine, thank you. Good. <laughs> I can't do it. It's just a test. I can't do it. Me, you'll get it. Just Willa? watch and learn. Kate, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you, Cammy. <laughs> what have you been up to today? Driving. Driving, a big adventure, and thanks for taking the time no to come here and, and speak to us. Now, we have done a, a nice introduction for you <laughs> in the future for the start of this podcast, but obviously we want to talk a lot about QMS mm-hmm. uh, and things surrounding that here on the pod. But we need to know a bit more about you. Can you can you tell us in your own words about yourself? So I am a fifth generation farmer um, from just outside Peebles in the Scottish borders. And uh, I farm there with my husband, Ed, and we have four kids, none of whom are there at the moment, but one of them looks like he might come back. Uh, so it is a sheep and cattle farm, typical. Well, it's a retenants, we don't own it. And I'm also a vet and chair of QMS. So oh, wow. a lot going on. Busy. Yeah, I don't practice as a vet anymore. I'm just, uh, I'm a qualified vet, but I'm not an in-practice vet. So did you practice for a while? Yeah, so um, I worked down in County Durham in the north of England for about eight years when I first qualified in a right sort of James Herriot-y type practice. Um, just me and my boss, and that's where I met my husband. Um, and then he moved back up with me to my family farm. So, yeah. Was he a vet as well? No, he was a farmer, still is a farmer, obviously, um, but his dad had had to sell the farm, so he was a farmer without a farm. Uh, so it worked worked quite well, because, you know, when you're growing up and you're going out with farmers, there's always that tension in you as to which farm are we actually going to live on here if you, you know, had previous boyfriends where you've kind of thought which farm are we going to mm, live yeah, on here yeah. <laughs> yeah the boy doesn't usually want to leave exactly yeah. so it was quite handy that ed didn't uh, have that tension so he moved back with me so uh yeah I so and, it, and how many acres you run in there so um there's about 1500 um 800 feet at the stead and up to 2200 in the back so we've got my dad always says we've got the best um low-lying ground in people sure but the worst hill so it's kind of Tale of, tale of you, two halves. What would you rather have, though? You'd rather have the best low-lying ground. The hill's bloody awful. Yeah. <laughs> but you'd rather have a, a good low light yes. than a good hill, yeah, I yes. would say. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, no, aye, it's a fair handling. How many sheep you run? So, we've got about 450 cross yows uh, in the parks and about, well, it's aiming for about 350 hill sheep, which are wear blackies and are now a kind of strange mixture of Cheviot cross blackies because we're in the oh. process of breeding the blackies out. So Yeah, go on, <gasps> tell us more. Why? They all look a wee bit weird. You're not the only... Listen, it's a, it's a, it'll, it'll, we'll have some uh, stalwart blackie followers, of course, uh, but I loved... And, and listen, I'm up and down the country all the time and I see it in a lot of places now uh-huh. that were always blackies are now Cheviots. Why are you swapping? Well... It's a, like I say, it's a rubbish hill. So when my dad first went there, um, the guy who was there before him said, if you get two lambs out of every yow every three years, you'll be doing well. Then you kill yourself. Okay. So basically scanning, if you were scanning about six, oh, 65, two, two lambs 70, every three years? Yeah, oh, right. 75%, that, that sort of thing. Right. In fact, wow. when scanning first came in, uh, dad got the, the park sheep scanned and he got the hill scanned the first year. And out of the 300, well, actually, I think he had about 450 then and he had two sets of twins. Uh, so really? he didn't scan again for many, many years because yeah. it was totally pointless. Just let them run. Um, yeah. But we were monitor farmers uh, about 10 years ago. And one of the things I wanted to do was find out whether we could make a better job or not. See, Dad had tried in the past. He'd bought he'd bought some of the... He'd some, occasionally gone to the market and bought the best pen of lambs he could yep. and taken them home. And they looked really good. And within six weeks of them being back at Hunnel Soap, they were just rubbish, the same as ours. This is the best pen of blackies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they were just rubbish like ours because it's just obviously what the hill can support. You know, yeah. it wasn't, uh-huh. it just it just can't support fantastic sheep. So when we were monitor farmers, I really wanted to know if we could do any better. And we did do a lot of things. We did trace elements. We did, um, we changed the way we fed them, top and things like that. And we actually got the scanning percentage up from about 75% to about 125, which was really, really good. Huge wow. jump. Um, but still, the the blacky weather lambs are just I mean, they're just rubbish, just absolute rubbish, because <laughs> they just were making no money at all. They're yeah. coming off this hill. I mean, it's not their fault. It's just the ground. Yeah, you mean your blacky weather lambs? Yeah, are rubbish. it's our blacky yeah, weather yeah, lambs. Just better cover that. <laughs> <there>. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not everybody. It's just ours. <laughs> I, I don't, it's, a, a lot of folk don't realise the secret power of the blacky world. It's like they'll just cancel us like if, <laughs> if, if, if we step out of line. 
the Blackie boys yeah. will get together and we're cancelled. Yeah. So it's like, it's like the Illuminati of the sheep world. <laughs> don't, you don't have to tell me. We're right we're, next door to Glen Ross. You're only, Campbell, you're so. only crossing the Machiavites because they allow you to do that. <laughs> okay, so just remember that. <laughs> uh, so you're next to the Campbells. So we're right next to the Campbells, right, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you know, they they have a much better hill than us, obviously, because their blackies are much better. Yes, yes. And so what is the difference? What is it that makes your hill so poor? It's just covered. It's really, really steep. Uh, loads of scree. It's covered with heather. It's just rubbish. But, yeah. but folk would say that's better for a blackie than achieve it. I don't know. We were just try. We just thought we'll try something different, and yeah. see what happens. Yeah. So we're about. Four years into the experiment, so yeah. And so there's a lot of really we, we had we were scanning the other day, and the scanner's going, "What are these exactly?" <laughs> Is that ah uh, okay? Because yeah, what you're like on the third three quarters cheviot now. Aye. So the 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 yow lambs we or the hogs we've got at the minute are the first three quarter cheviot ones, and they look like cheviots, but anything that's half and half just looks like weird. Yeah. They look like but, mules, but not mules. Yeah. We, we need to get a timer and start getting a timer on this podcast for how, see how long it takes us to mention a blackie. Yeah. <laughs> That's that, our new leaderboard. That, that's the running thing, yeah. It's like, how long does it take to mention a blackie? Because we always seem to manage to mention them. But it helps when, you, when obviously you're running some, it's easy to do. Get ready for a successful turnout and choose Crystalix this grazing season. Spring grass is typically fast growing and lush. However, it can contain high levels of potassium, which reduces magnesium availability. Crystalix cattle HiMag incorporates multiple magnesium sources and is proven through trials at Glasgow University to help maintain normal blood magnesium levels. With 35% sugar and a unique blend of vitamins, minerals and trace elements, Crystalix cattle HiMag supports optimal performance at turnout. So, yeah, so okay, you're, you're, and who's your scanner? Stuart Wright. Oh, aye, 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 he does a lot of sheep. Yep. Aye, aye. Um, so, right, okay, that's interesting. How was they scan at? So we just scanned them the other day and, uh, well, we, we haven't got them all. That's the trouble because we've got this great big hill mm. um, and there's just the two of us and it gave us a week's notice, but I was working quite a bit. So we just basically got what came into the snacker. Yeah, yeah. So we got about two thirds of them. We scanned about 220, I think. Yeah. Uh, and they came out at about 120%. So, okay, so. but seven yelled, seven yelled out of 220. And I can remember scanning Very sheep good. and there being 70, 80 going through yelled because... Yeah. Yeah. As you know, as the guy told my dad, they're only having a lamb out two out of every three years. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So oh, well, you're down at you're yeah. down at about three percent there. Yeah. Um, so it's like is, you know, yeah. that's what we want. I didn't want twins. I didn't want loads and loads of twins out of them. I just want them all to have a lamb. Uh, there was mm -hmm. a. Do you read the Scottish Farmer? Uh, yep. Yeah. There's not, I'm not going to challenge you too much. Here, don't <laughs> worry. Uh, but there's a, an article last week about uh, saying that farmers don't know their barren rate. Which I thought was very strange because I would argue that just about every farmer knows their barn rate. It was a strange thing they put on. I think maybe what the problem is they're asking the farmer what their barn rate is, and the farmer <laughs> yeah, says, oh, I don't know." <laughs> yeah, I think like every farmer, if you scan, you know your barn rate. Well, scanning's the only real figure that a lot of people know because you mm -hmm. get you handed it on a bit of paper. You know, yeah. if you if you're not the sort of person that goes and starts working out, you know, feed deficiency and daily live weight gain and stuff you, you're not going to know it but you're going to know you're scanning it because you're handed yeah. it yeah it's a good point i couldn't even tell you what our lambs are averaging this year you know it's over 100 pounds but like i, yeah. I can't tell you whereas the only like you say the only yeah. actual factual figure i know yep. are how many sheep i have and what the scan results were mm -hmm. that's the mm -hmm. only sort of performance type figures i have well you're one better than me because i don't know how many sheep we've got because we, <laughs> <never, laughs> we, we, we can never gather them all <laughs> it's whatever the flock book says <laughs> There's um, a lot of black loss in Hunnels. So yeah, so I can imagine. <laughs> but no, it was the article was interesting. So mm. it said that, that most farmers, I can't remember the percentage, they said don't know their barn rate. As I say, that that, that mm. isn't true. But they then went on to say that if you're not getting 2% barren, then you have a, 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 you know, you should be speaking to your vet or there's a, a major issue. But uh, like, I think that's, they're being um, so what do you mean? extreme at that. So, so they're saying that if your sheep aren't, and two percent around the two percent barren mark. Mm -hmm. So two something out of every hundred yield, that's you're doing something wrong. But that's like like I scan a lot of sheep, yeah. and there's very few places I go mm -hmm. to that are, that are two percent. This yeah. is where I slip in that we were one point five this year, but that, <laughs> that that was just that's just luck. Yeah. Um, like, but there's yeah. hard, I thought it was just strange. That this, whereas I would say a much more reasonable target from my experience of scanning. And, and folk will find this interesting, I think, if it's is, is 4% is good. Okay. Yeah, well, 2% is great, obviously. 
four percent and under is where you want to be. Mm-hmm. Up to eight percent, you're you're in around where a lot of people are. If you're getting over eight percent into ten t- and above, mm-hmm. you're getting quite high. Um, but we've seen a lot of hill scans this year, a lot of empty sheep. Right. Like whether it's been. Yeah. I think a big factor would be if your Tuppen Park was too big. You know, if your if your your field for Tuppen was too big. Mm-hmm. Or you're you're doing them maybe in a low bit of hill that where it's a big scope and the weather was so bad they were the tips not going looking yeah. for the ewes mm-hmm. yeah you know I think that was a big factor I think some of them wouldn't even have seen the tip of the ewes like that's I think would be a factor where does like see for articles like that where do they get those figures from mm-hmm. good question because I've never been asked yeah that's mm-hmm. what I'm thinking like because where do they how do they know well there's one for yeah. uh, anyone at the Scottish Farmer where did you get the figures for that article it would be good to actually know that one mm-hmm. and you do wonder we had a we had a lecturer at vet school I can clearly remember it uh, quite early on and he, he was telling us about lambing and what he said was if you go onto a farm as a vet and they have more than two lamb deaths out of every hundred one pre-birth and one after birth then there's something seriously wrong with the farm but two percent dead Oh, at Lamentine. No way. Time. No way. No. And, and all these vet students who weren't from farms were sitting there writing all this yeah. down. And you're thinking, where do you think up with that? You're giving them the wrong idea here, you know, because. And, that ag- is... and again, where are the record books for that? Yeah. Oh, well, it's. I mean, one thing we've never worked out for good reason no. is our losses from scanning to weaning or, 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 or right. what we actually sell, let's say, uh, because it'd be huge. You should do, you know, though. When oh, we we're were, we're, we're, we're we were farmers, we had a death book. Yeah. And it's not easy at the time writing it down, but it but actually tells you, you quite a lot. I, you don't even need a death book, though. Like, like I've worked out, we've worked out that we should have 1,716 lambs mm-hmm. this year. Yeah. Based on the, what the scanner says. <laughs> uh, but the good thing is the scanner usually misses a few, so that helps with, the, with this <laughs> side of things. So 1,700, and let's say 1,700 lambs. So I'll just take that figure. Mm-hmm. Write that at the top of the page, and then I either look at what we win, or yep. the actual best measure is what you sell. Yes. Yeah, Aye. Take, take. Never mind what you win. Like, what do you actually sell? And quite, then that's that's yeah. your. It's quite good to know where you've lost them, though, because the year I did it and, and wrote down every lamb that died and whether it was a twin or a triplet or whatever, and discovered that over half of the deaths were related in some way to triplets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You that's know, so it kind of shows of you how to where to focus. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we've got a hundred. I'm gonna lamb them outside. <laughs> <laughs> that laugh says it all. I, know, I think it could be. Well, do, do you know what? I'm not, you, we're, we're amazing tangents here. Pet lambs today at Carlisle. Did you hear about this? No. I, saw, I saw a video on Facebook. Uh, How much are they making? Up to a hundred quid. They oh average. They average forty pounds. Like, and I'm like, they must be big lambs. Boy, sent me a picture. It's a wee lamb just after. It's, it's a wee triplet just left it after if it's mother. There was a video. There's a video of them selling pounds. them. Aye. What is it? I, I honestly have no idea. Aye, well, I've gonna have a hundred to sell at that. But is it townies? Well, I was just wondering that. Well, oh, no, some, if it's a, maybe it's the kids. I know a lot of boys sell at, uh, at Easter holidays at Lanark. There's a pet lamb sale and they sell for the Easter holidays because the kids come and get a couple of pet lambs to take mm-hmm. for the small holdings and stuff. But in your CPH, it's not townies. In your CPH, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was mind blowing. Like, but then we should put up the video. It's, hey, it's, it's probably Rob. <laughs> <laughs> We had Rob Atkinson in last week uh, d- talking about buying store lambs. Probably Rob. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably putting a milk machine now. I'm starting really early. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, that was uh, so. That's we, we're right. gonna we're gonna do that this year. We start Aye. with 1700 total and see what we, we end yeah. with. But I I could just about I would just about say we will be somewhere between 15 and 20 percent losses. Mm-hmm. And I think that's about it's about normal because well, you lose they, they them before the lamb. And, oh, they, you know, they, 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 they say anyone. The thing I tell was anyone ten percent mm-hmm. is a problem. But I'm like, you're doing well if you keep it at ten yeah. percent. And an example I had last year, my first two years, uh, start a lambing, you always get your problems yeah, at the start, always, problems yeah. at the end. Uh, first two problems we had last year, two sets of triplets, all dead lambs. There's six lambs away, yeah. so I then I now need my next sixty lambs to be alive. Mm-hmm. just to be at 10% yeah, and matter. you never get 60 yeah. lambs in a row alive no. like never not when you've that many triplets lambing so it's like 10% is a dream already I'm yeah. six lambs down yeah. before I started <laughs> I filled a bag <laughs> <laughs> and they're not even due for another four days that's that's the nightmare right? so yeah well, I'll, I'll put that we'll talk about it again in the podcast I'm, I'm going to tell you something you can tell me if this is common because I thought it was really weird when we were scanning our park yows we, um, we maybe get a set of quads once every couple of years we don't get many quads at all yep. um, 
and this big yow came across halfway through this batch, 450 sheep. Stuart scanned, he says four. I was like, oh God, four. Honestly, I don't want any more of them. They're just a pain in the neck. Very next yow that came over. He says, you'll never believe this, another four. No other quads in the whole lot, but they came one after the other. That is do you so get weird. that? Uh, do, do you know, it's there is, there's something in that. But, uh, now, I'm not saying two quads together is a very, very rare thing, but it's amazing how often you, you hardly see an empty sheep and all of a sudden two come at once. Yeah. So they're hanging out together? It's just strange yeah, that... It's, or, it or, weird. or potentially they're, they're sisters and they're just bad genetic. You know, mm. uh, yeah. you know that they're, they're, they've ran together all the time because they're a set of twins, twin new mm. lambs or something. They're, yeah. they're, they're pally, it's a couple of gimmers. But it's amazing how often... You know, you could be 80 sheep in, no no mm-hmm. empties, and then mm-hmm. boom, two. Yeah. Well, I've, got, an, I've got another weird one. Go on. Um, same Is it sheep. sheep related? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to tell you about what we can. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, same sheep, two years in a row, quads. Okay, yeah. And a, a blackie? Yeah. A, and a, we a, never we never have quads. Yeah. We never have quads. quads. Quads two, year quads, in a row. two years in a row. Now that is rare. Isn't it? Yeah. I can't remember how Usually many ended up alive. Usually a quad knocks it right out of them. And we could put the photos mm. up. Dad took photos of her both years. But yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, that is good, yeah. Well, it's not well, good. Well, no, it's terrible. Yeah, it's ter- it's <laughs> not- probably end up with one alive out of the eight. Yeah, but- it, it's not good, but yeah, no, it's interesting. Um, no, but I, that's a... Uh, uh, two quads and a blackie two years now. I know. It's good at Chris. They've got the best bit of the hill in your Kirk, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I have never, I, we hardly ever even get triplets and blackies, let alone quads. Do you want quads? Yeah. No, 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 we're the same. Aye. No. Well, that's good. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll put up those scanning loss results or those uh, losses at lambing time once we get started lambing. But obviously, what. Big time farmer, fifth generation is impressive. I take it's a secure tenancy. Yes, uh huh. Yeah. How many yeah. generations has the secure tenancy passed through? Um, so the farm that I'm on, it was just my dad, but the the sort of home farm, two farms along where my cousin is, um, so that would, it, it came through my gran actually. So it's come down the female line before, uh, and it was would be her grandfather that first went there. So over 150 years, right, okay. Um, we've been there, so uh, quite rooted, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it, it's a. Uh, you know, there's still a lot of secure tenancies out there and yeah. they're one of those beautiful things. I don't know if you... Did you hear the chat we had yeah. with Margo? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're one of those, like, beautiful, yeah. beautiful things. Like, and, and, and there's so many stories like your own where it's been passed down through so many generations. Mm-hmm. It, it's uh, it's quite incredible. But you, you're hoping one of the... Have you got boys? Four kids. Uh, I've got a daughter who's uh, nearly 25. She's a trainee solicitor. Twin boys who are 20, one of whom is... David might be the farmer. Um, the other one's doing biology, and my youngest is nineteen, and he's doing computing. So, okay, it's quite interesting. You can see from very early on if they're going to be keen and what, or not. What, what put them off the farming? They just weren't. Uh, the youngest, Michael. I mean, he would come out and help anytime you asked him to, but he just he didn't like being dirty. He didn't like he doesn't like right. blood and guts. He doesn't he just doesn't like it. So yeah, yeah. you could tell you know from about age mm. two three that it wasn't going to be for him. Yeah. Okay. Um. It's tough, eh? It's one yeah. of the things. It's like, like like with Iona's situation as well. Like, it wasn't for them either. So, and, and you know, Iona's dad's been on uh, speaking mm-hmm. as well. It's like, you can't force them to do something they no. don't want to do. And, and they'll just resent you for it. Well, there's, exactly. There's a, there's a lot of farmers in either taking on the farm or secure tents or whatever that never wanted to be farmers. Well, absolutely. Yeah. And my dad always said to both me and my brother, if you want to, be, if you want to do it, that's fine. If you don't, you know... Don't worry about it. We're a tenant farm. We'll just sell up and, and move on. So we've very much said that to our own kids. Uh-huh. There's four of you. You have to make it work. If all of you want to do it, you're going to have to find something else to make it work. If only one of you wants it, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So yeah. so no pressure. But if, and How many cattle do you say you're running? Um, we've got about 75 suckler cows just now. Yeah, so it's, a fair, it's a fair enough outfit. Like, it's a good going yeah. business. Like, yeah. even without all your extra stuff with QMS. And... Aye, you can, you can make a living. One family can make a living. Yeah. Um, mm. If there was four of them, obviously they'd all have no. to do other things. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it yeah. looks like it's only Dave that's particularly interested. So, But I want him to go away and work somewhere else first. Yeah. Get some real life experience bring something different back to the farm well absolutely because what's what's the point in them coming back and just doing what we've always done he needs to go off and see what else is out there and then come back maybe in a few years time when he can say to both me and his dad this is what we're doing yeah and this is me making the decision whereas if he came back just now he'd maybe be suggesting things and you'd be getting Nah, no, 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 we don't do it like that. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. He just needs to go out and get I think that's experience. a really healthy and modern way of thinking, though, from you as well, you know, and encouraging that. And yeah. It's what I think it's what you 
had yourself, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So I mean, I came home from school when I was I was always I always wanted to be a farmer, and I came home from school. I think I'd be about sixteen for my careers day, and I said to my I announced to my dad I'm leaving school and coming home to work on the farm, and he announced very quickly back to me that there was no way on earth I was doing that. You know, mm-hmm. um, he said go and do something else. I don't care what you do. We made a deal that if I could go and do anything else I wanted and it would be there. And he said the same to my brother. You know, he was very good that we were both mm. equal. My brother's never been that interested. Um, and I just thought at that point, well, what's going to be the best thing if I'm a farmer? How am I going to save myself some money? Vet school. So plan A was vet school. Plan B, I worked in um, the butchers and people's at the weekends on my Saturday job. So plan B was going to train to be a butcher. So got into vet school. So I've never done the butchery thing, but. It's funny that I'm now back at QMS where it's all uh, full circle, but ties d- d- just I love that. Just that I'm oh, just going to go and be a vet. Is that easy? <laughs> You're obviously very clever. I was quite, I was quite academic, and oh, that dad get that wants to be a vet isn't that clever, in my opinion, because <laughs> it's like you're doing all that studying, all that work, and like it's no great pay. Like unless you no. got up to be a partner in a big practice, yeah. like they're doing it for the love of the job, and it's like. No. Yeah, I, I didn't. Lot. I didn't encourage on call at nights all the time. Well, and... on call killed me. Yeah. It really did. did. I was on a one and two row. My boss was brilliant. Um, a bit mad, but brilliant. <laughs> uh, total James Herriot. It really was total James Herriot. Uh, and we, I, I did a one and two for eight, the eight years. And towards the end, foot and mouth hit, mm. and it was right in the middle of where we were. So I think the sixth diagnosed case of foot and mouth was one of our clients. Oh. So we're right in the middle of it. Uh, and she went off, my boss went off to work for the ministry because they were crying out for vets. Yes, but, yeah. So I worked about five months, like 24 seven with a, Alex would be about a year old at the time, oh, um, yeah. which was really, really tough going. Mm. Um, and your life, your, your, your sort of outlook changes a bit once you've got kids, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I suppose change. Foot, foot and mouth became almost like that wartime mentality where it's oh. like, you know, yeah. It, Everybody, all hands to the pump. Mm-hmm. It's it's a mm-hmm. co- it's like you have no choice. Like, no. do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, like yeah. It's like the Holliers. Um, I knew boys that were involved in the Hollier jo- side of things. Like, mm-hmm. and it was just like all hands to to the floor. Like, mm-hmm. just flat out hauling these dead it's the stock to the files. Oh. Like, it was. It was it was awful. We were just just down from Tau Law. There was a great big pyre up at Tau Law, and you could see the smoke and stuff. Mm. I mean, it was just it was just hideous, and it just none of what none of the rules that they had kind of made sense on the ground and. I remember you had to print off movement licenses and it was all fax machines then. And you had Mm. to stand for hours with these fax machines printing off movement licenses so people could move things from one field to another. And, oh, it was utter chaos. Yeah. Um, And it just really, that was was the sort of final straw. And and would you know, I know this is in your department as such, but the the way they have movement uh, regulations now in terms of moving holding to holding, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of that off the back of the foot and mouth. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think there was, I'm trying to remember back then, but I'm, I'm sure there was, you had to report movements back then, but it wasn't quite as... Because uh, like the system now as... is terrible for somebody like me. Like it's, yeah. it's a doddle if you just have a CPH. Yeah. Well, that was part of the problem. Mm. I mean, foot and mouth, there'd been a whole load of sheep come out of Longtown, hadn't there? And nobody really knew where they were. Yeah. Um, or not, they they didn't know where they were quick enough, which is how it got out of hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can see that though. I mean, but like for me, like if I've got I've got awful. like 20, 20 holdings yeah. through the winter. But if I move sheep, so you're allowed for anyone doesn't know your CPH is your uh, county parish holding number, which is like just a, a a location code that you have for your farm essentially. But I have my main location code, but unfortunately none of my other bits are within five miles of that main location code. Oh. So if I move sheep from a field one mm-hmm. field to the next. I need to do, to do fill it a full form and send away and do all this absolute nonsense. Whereas, yeah. you know, farmers that have all their land in a ring fence farm, mm-hmm. which is the system is designed for, mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and they would argue that this, let's say, is for things like foot and mouth mm-hmm. is, is the main reason you know where all the sheep is. Yeah. But the simple solution for me is, in my situation, you put all 20 hold numbers Linked to the one, yeah. Because mm-hmm. you can guarantee yeah. if I, if if I have foot and mouth in one holding, yeah, you're gonna have it through. Yeah. They're, well, yeah. they're killing the whole lot. Yeah, yeah. Like so, it's stupid to mm-hmm. to be doing it individually. Yeah. Just put them in a pool, and if one bit goes wrong or one bit's near a bit that's went wrong, you may as well wipe mm-hmm. out the whole lot because I'm using the same wrapper gates. Yeah. I'm using yeah. the same stock trailer. Like so, for me, it's just totally. Yeah. It's, not, it's not designed. I mean, do you know what the current system reminds me of when I used to work in the police, like. <laughs> It's so old fashioned. The yeah. fact we're still writing on a, oh, a, yeah. a, a, a no carbon slip bit mm-hmm. of paper and hand it like yeah. it's so but it's money. 
like computer yeah. software to yeah. improve things and streamline mm. it is millions of pounds mm -hmm. that nobody they don't have. Same with the police. The police, like, there's so much time wasted by police officers mm -hmm. using old, outdated systems because yep. to update those systems, like software and that, it's millions mm -hmm. and millions of pounds that they don't have. Yep. So, so yeah. they waste all their time. You'd laugh. You'd honestly laugh if you saw some of the old, the, the recording systems really? the police use. So bad. Like old, like, <laughs> analog text. and Really? Oh, some of the... And, like, you have to phone up... A, they've slightly tweaked it now, but I used to, you'd have to phone up a call handler who had special training to use this system just to up, add in like names of people and stuff. Oh God. Oh, so it's all, mm -hmm. you'd have to sit in a hold line for ages. And if you didn't get somebody, you had to record it, then you need to wait three days for it to appear <laughs> on the thing. Oh, come on. Oh, the whole thing was just ridiculous. So same with the farming yeah. setup. We're There's just no not, money for it. We're just not very good at sort of future proofing that sort of thing yeah. somehow. You know, when, when foot and mouth hit, I mean, I look back in my, in my vet school notes, which I'd kept, and it basically, and whether they'd told us more and I just hadn't listened or whether they didn't tell us, I don't know. But I had written under foot and mouth, last year in the 1960s, if seen, call a policeman. That was all I had written down. Right. Really? And that's what they taught you at vet school? Well, that's what I'd taken from it. They yeah, may okay. have tried to tell us other things and that's what I'd written down. Yeah. But, but that was... That was all I had because the assumption was, well, we used to have it, but it's gone now. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? So nobody was ready for it at all. But it's it gone now. Chaos. Well, <laughs> let's hope so. Touch wood. This blue tongue thing makes you scary, like how yeah. things can come across. Like yeah. in, in milder weather is a big factor. Like these midges uh, seem to be the... What is that? That's what's spreading it? Well, yeah. that's what brings it across the channel because yeah, it's been so bloody mild. They blow you know? across. I was down at the NFU conference in Birmingham a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and the, the farmers down there further south are really, really worried about it. Well, it, they're also causing a nightmare with Schmollenberg. Mm -hmm. Twenty. I, I was told 20% of flocks down there have Schmollenberg. What is that? Uh, it's just basically like a... Def uh, it's a type of disease. I was going to say it's kind of like... Um, these things you see, like, uh, I suppose like you had the Zika virus with humans, mm -hmm. where the babies end up being born deformed. It's a kind yeah. of similar thing with Schmollenberg, but for, for animals, ca uh, cows as well, but uh, really, really rife in sheep. And it's like the midges essentially spread it about. God knows how, but, well, obviously dirty infected mm -hmm. midges somehow, but they're, they're nipping at the sheep and the sheep have deformed lambs. Like legs fuse together mm -hmm. or fuse straight. And you can't, I the, the, the worst just... thing is you can't get the bloody lamb out. Mm -hmm. Oh, we, oh, of course. Because it, yeah. yeah, yeah. it fuses like at a right angle. <gasps> yeah. oh, listen to me talking about Schmilm, but I've got the vet here. <laughs> um, but you, you can stop me yeah. if I'm wrong. Um, and you end up, you need to like snap. Oh, it's, it's, Awful. It's, 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 it's such a big thing. I mean, mentally, it's, it destroys yeah. farmers oh, yeah. like yeah. because you the do so thing. much bloody work. You know, mm. We, we talk about this is a real crucial time of year for farmers, especially sheep farmers, but there's a lot of guys calving cows as well, mm. and there's a lot more money tied up in cows yeah. generally than, than in sheep. But your things like a bad scan, folk don't realise this time of year how much a bad scan mm. can just sit in a farmer's head. Oh, yeah. Because mm -hmm. you do the bad scan, then you're, you're not looking forward to lambing. Yeah. Because you're blown mm -hmm. it, you know, you feel like you're blown it for that year, and really yeah, a lot of there's it's no, there's no betterment from it. It just is what it is. You just it, have you're to, twelve months to you get yeah, a chance yeah, to do yeah. it again. Like, and I think folk we probably don't talk about it enough how much a bad scan mm -hmm. affects and, farmers. And I think particularly this time of year when when any social stuff starts to wind down a bit, you're not out there speaking to other folks, no. so you're not hearing no what and, other people's. You know, you're yeah. not hearing that it's not just you. And yeah. that's what, yeah, I think that's what another thing that people, well, you're saying people hold their cards close to their chest with their scanning percentages as well. Would it see if it was just a public figure that you could see every year that this is the average? Yeah, I think what I need, I, I'd have thought I need to start doing more videos where I encourage farmers to, I turn up at the farm, what kind of sheep have you got? How many we scanned today? What percentage mm -hmm. you're hoping for? Then at the end, that's your percentage. What do you think you did right? What do you think you did wrong? Mm -hmm. And share it out there. And like, the response that we'd get from other farmers. Oh, yeah. Because it becomes this, like, it's, it's all right for me because I see them all, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. Very mu it's very much like being a vet or a GP. Yeah. Like, you know, a bit like I, I would never... Uh, and yeah, you're not going to tell MDLs. I'd never. No, mm -hmm. Like, Absolutely. see, I'm at full glass and yeah. straight away I'll say, listen, I wouldn't tell them to do your scanning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'll say, oh, it was a good scan. Like, yeah. you, you yeah. just don't, it's, yeah. you really, no, it's one of those precious things you'd, yeah. you'd really offend Absolutely. folk. But, like, it's, I find it really difficult, like, when I go somewhere and it is a bad scan, because I know how crushing it, like, it would yeah, crush me. Yeah. So, like, yeah, yeah, you are like a GP giving bad yeah. news, you know, you're like, and, yeah. you know, you, and quite often I'll, you know, I'll sit and talk it through with them, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. what tups were you using, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what happened at tupping time, anything specific, you know, mm -hmm. fluke, mm -hmm. all these kind of things. And 
it's, so it's, hard. Yeah, it's just a crusher. So, like, it, you know, if MD yeah. is listening and they are, l- let me tell you, there's plenty of folk mm-hmm. out there on a the similar boat. You're not the only one. And, yeah. and sharing that does help. I remember back to when we were we were monitor farmers, and I don't know if you remember, particularly if it was bad over here, 2013 was awful. It was the worst lambing I've ever done. It rained all winter. We had... I mean, everything was skin and bone because mm-hmm. there was just nothing mm-hmm. to eat. It was just an absolute nightmare. And we, you went through lambing and it really is the only, the only, like, I love lambing time usually, but I just absolutely hated yeah, it. The yows didn't have any milk, you know. the lambs and walk away. Yeah, they didn't mm-hmm. want them. It was just hideous. And we had a monitor farm meeting um, in the middle of May. And by that point, we kind of got to know each other a bit. And what you find is if you open up, people open up back to you so we're in this monitor farm meeting and you know we're just saying this is what happened it was awful and the number of people then oh that was just the same for me and it didn't actually physically help MD's bottom line but it made you all feel better because it you felt it wasn't just you that you'd done something wrong you know it was just the sort of year it was and it made it more it made it just made it easier for everybody and I think that's another thing with lambing when it's so busy farmers (laughs) basically well dad for that three weeks he literally doesn't leave the farm Mm -hmm. like he literally doesn't leave the farm so he can go for those three weeks without speaking to anybody apart from us and what that can do to you mentally Mm -hmm. if you're just in that bubble and not aware of what yeah what's happening with other people it it yeah, it can be so well, negative. And that's why I've, I've mentioned it before. Like when I do my lambing vlogs every day, like we always show, like you get people comments saying they're not watching them because there's just all death. Mm. But like mm-hmm. the only things you deal with lambing time are the problems. Yep. Yeah. The, the yeah. good ones just run just on. Go. Yeah, exactly. You know, you can take a wee shot at them as they walk, as you drive <laughs> past. But like, yep. so folk think it's all death, but actually you've had 10 good twins away and mm-hmm. then there's one that's hung a lamb and it's a, it's a disaster. Mm. But that's all you're filming. But yeah. the amount of messages I get from people that, like, especially last year, I think it was the second and third of April. It was an absolute nightmare. Like I was just wind and rain. It was even worse up uh, further up north. There's people I was hearing yeah. stories like mm-hmm. 40, forty dead lambs in a mm-hmm. morning round. Mm-hmm. Nothing worse. I well, at least we were, f- we were cold, but we weren't snowy, sleety yeah. cold. Um, but even I was dead lambs and mm-hmm. uh, ho- everything that had fresh lamb that morning. You had to haul it in and aye, so much more work. You were soaking wet and knackered and chasing your tail and like sharing that with people. They would come in from a hard day's lambing. They yeah. put on the sheep game mm-hmm. and. It made them the message I was getting like it made them feel better yeah. because yeah. it wasn't just them. It wasn't just them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and we get we we, yeah. we dwell on yeah. it too much. No, um, you're so right, Cammy. Yeah. And I, but I also think you're a good personality in that way, and that you do you have got a positive attitude as well. I, but I suppose as well, maybe filming helps you with that too because. Oh, it does. I'm, I have to force it. Yeah, yeah. Like I, no, like I like I. Like Inside, I, 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 I am. Feel... I am very positive anyway yeah. and laughy. But like, if I, I and I've said this before in the podcast, it's like therapy. Yeah, mm-hmm. because I don't just look at the problem and deal with it quietly and miserable and like, oh my god, this yeah, is. Yeah. I have to talk. I have to describe why this has happened. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that makes me think oh, it's not really your fault. It's the, I mean, the yeah. weather. What can well, you nine do times about out of ten, it? it's the weather that's, that's so caused the problem, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You know, I mean, sometimes it is my fault. You know, I've missed a lamb that's that's yeah. hungry in the morning yeah. and it's near death at night, mm-hmm. and that's my fault. I've missed it. She's a bad teat. I should have seen it. Yeah, but I own up to that as well because yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, but you can't be. But that's so healthy. That's yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. You're doing good. Do you see this year? Do you see this year? <laughs> <laughs> to lamb, I know. Um, this, these triplets outside. Uh, but what we're going to do, we've, we've had a good chat about sheep farming and, and other things. We want to talk about KMS, so that's yeah, why yeah, you're here. Well, and we're, yes. we're halfway through already, oh, so we'll, we'll have a quick word from one of our sponsors and we'll be right back. Most foragers don't supply sheep and cattle with enough cobalt, copper, iodine and selenium, critical to digestion, immunity, reproduction and growth. When it comes to supplementation, there's a danger of under or oversupply. But when bolusing with Animax Tracure, you can be sure every animal has enough for up to six months in one single application. Animax, giving what it takes. And we're back. Right, Kate, let's get into this QMS. Like, let's give you a hard time. <laughs> Why? Why am I only getting £3.40 a kilo for my lambs? What what are you doing? <laughs> eh? Why am I paying my levies? <laughs> yeah, funnily enough, you're not the first person to say something like that to me. But <laughs> <laughs> prices are pretty good at the minute, you know. I was looking at the figures. Thirty yeah. percent above the five year average this wow. year. Thirty percent yeah. above it. See before we get into it. Yeah, like, I'm I'm going all technical. <laughs> okay, yeah. Expl- yeah so you, do you would it. just you... say what QMS? 
First of all, what it stands for. No, yeah. what it stands for and what it is. So QMS is Quality Meat Scotland. Mm-hmm. And what we are are the um, levy body for red meat in Scotland. So that's sheep, cattle and pigs. Mm-hmm. And a long, long time ago, I think way back into the 1960s, um, industry or whoever, somebody decided that it might be a good idea to take a little bit of money from every animal and use it for marketing. So that started way, way back, I think in 1967 or something. In fact, I did find once on Hansard the the actual debate in Parliament where it was set up. It was called the MLC then, the Meat and Livestock Commission, I think. Um, So it's evolved over the years. Obviously, we've had devolution Mm -hmm. and now we're separate. So we are the levy body in Scotland. HDB are the levy body in England and HCC, which stands for some Welsh words that I don't know how to pronounce. (laughs) Cymru will be one of them. Yeah, Cymru is the last one, but I don't know what the other two are. Hig something, um, there in Wales. So okay. we all collect a levy on every single animal that is killed in our country. Currently, at the minute, it's the the farmer pays 80 pence for every sheep that's killed. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's not a percentage? No, it's it's um, a, a pence. Um, that's strange. It's £4.20 for every cow, and I think it's around about a pound for pigs. How, that was going to be one of my questions. How is, how is QMS funded? Oh, no, I knew that. I yeah, didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so we collect that's that. That's how demons of it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, okay. So yeah. every animal, it, there's a bit paid by the farmer, there's a bit paid by the producer, by the, sorry, processor. Um, and oh, they, again, they contribute as well. Yeah, and again, that's historical. Way back to when it was set up, um, farmers contributed some, processors contributed uh, some. And is that done at market level? Uh, so obviously uh, dead weight, but let's talk live weight. Do, do they, does the, the producer, so, the farmer... He gets a levy charge on his line. So the auction mark, yeah. And then the buyer will get a levy charge on his line as well. So the auction marks collect it for cast animals usually. And we usually get it from the processors for prime stock. Okay. But a store, you know, store animals going through don't have any levy charge them. It's only at that point in slaughter. Yeah, it's only prime lambs yeah. and uh, yeah, yeah. And, and cash shows. Yeah. yeah. So and what are so um, so what do QMS do? So we collect that levy. Mm-hmm. In Scotland, it's also slightly more complicated because what we also do separately from that, but it's the same organisation that do it, is run the quality assurance schemes. Mm-hmm. So in England, you've got two different organisations that do that. You've got Red Tractor who run the, the farm assurance and you've got AHDB who, who are the levy body. Um, but in Scotland, we do both. Okay. Um, so the levy money is our only source of income. The quality assurance membership that we, ch- if people are farm assured, they have to pay a membership. All that does is actually pay for the the certification body to go out and certify them. We don't actually make any money off that at all. It's just money in, money out. Okay. Good. But it's the levy that pays for, um, well, it's marketing, industry development, um, market development, all that sort of side of promotion, you know, promotion and development of the industry is what the levy pays for. So it's... It's kind of complicated, and it, well, it's more complicated in Scotland. And also because it's a statutory levy, it's basically a tax. And so we have to be what they call it, a, a non-departmental public body because government need to authorise us to collect the, collect the tax. We don't right, get any okay. money from government. All the money that we use is but from the sector. because you are collecting like a tax. But because it, we're collecting so a tax. similar to BBC? I suppose it is, yeah. 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 You, you can't opt out of it, so... yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it is. So it just means that we are um, subject to a lot of the same audits and things that all the other, other loads of other government departments are subject to to make sure that we are providing value for taxpayers' money. You know, so we are audited at the same level as NHS Lothian. You know, you've got the same sort of requirements for reporting and, and all that sort of stuff because you're affiliated to government. We're not government, but we're, you know, we're kind of arm's length is what they call it. Yeah, and you know, you're on eighty pence. You're saying a lamb. Yeah. And four twenty uh, for right. a beast. Yeah. What's AHDB? So, slightly different. Um, cheaper. Historic- cheaper. You mean? Um, HCC are more than us per animal, and HDB I think are slightly less, but they are increasing their levy this year by twenty five percent. We are hoping to link our levy to inflation. So not actually increase it by one big block, just increase it a slight amount every year to keep it, keep up with inflation. I'm surprised you don't just do it. See, I, I would think 
it would make sense for a boat for a department or a and an organization like yourself that is essentially trying to well you're promoting the product but mm -hmm. by virtue you're trying to increase the value of the product yeah through, through marketing it would make much more sense to me if you were a percentage based levy because then you're rewarded for the better you promote the product then if you're not doing yeah. your job you suffer yeah and see you're just, yeah. i have a problem where you just get the money no matter what we've been out i don't have a problem with the land prices <laughs> But do you know what I mean? It's like there's no incentive for you to work harder. Yeah, we've been out consulting on that. And one or two people have, have raised that when we're making more money, should I pay more money? But my, argu well, my argument might be if prices are bad, then surely that's when we need to invest more in marketing to get them up again. I don't know. And also it, it would make it very difficult, at, even at, at a logistical level, to, to change that all the time. Do you know what I mean? The levy hasn't gone up, by the way, since 2010. At all. Yeah, it's pretty solid then. So it's been yeah, sitting it's due for a change. It's been sitting at the same amount for the past thirteen years. So so you're saying there's maybe a wee bump up coming soon? So that's what we are hoping to do is just link it to inflation. So it would just go up, you know, by pence. Ten percent. Um eight pence or so. It you I think I think for the past year we're looking at round about seven percent. So Ah, right, so let, well, like six for, pence. For me, yeah. For me, with our farm, we're not selling any finished cattle, we're selling finished lamb, it would be about thirty quid. 35 quid. For the year? For the year. Increase. I, th so. I don't think Andy's really going to complain. In 13 that. years to be going up by that. Yeah, plus, like, as I, as I joked at the start, like, <laughs> somebody's doing something right. You know, because, and, and I've said that, we talk about this a lot in the podcast, mm -hmm. and I know we'll, we should, we'll cover the beef element because that's going well as well, but New Zealanders are getting 60 pounds ahead for their lamb. Yeah. I've done a bit of New Zealand lamb in the shop yeah. as if the New Zealanders are, are, are yeah. uh, top trumping us somehow. But, like, we're the ones that are top trumping. We're the ones that are getting into the, the, the markets that really value them. Yeah. You know, do you know and, what I mean? And so much of it, I mean, we obviously do as, we do what we can to, to promote it and to develop new markets and get people to mm -hmm. buy it. But at a, a higher level, global trade flows have, have so much effect on us. They really do, and on everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we, I was speaking to our counterparts in Uruguay. Uruguay are a huge beef producing nation. Mm -hmm. And two years ago, they were getting about the same as we were getting as we were getting for beef, and it's cut in half mm. this year. And it's two things: they had a drought, and China, the economic situation in China means that their main export market, which is China, they aren't buying as much and paying as much. So well, within that's, two that's years, part of the problem in New Zealand lamb as yeah. well. Yeah. So you know, I think places like China have such a huge impact on all of us. On us too. Yeah, absolutely, because it changes sort of it changes the flow of products around the world and it can make a real difference i do feel there's some sort of southern hemisphere northern hemisphere divide on it though especially with lamb beef as well a little bit but yeah you know and, and a lot of the weather has a huge effect as well el nino has a has a huge effect so australia will go through a drought and america will be having a good time and producing quite a lot and then it'll it'll flip over uh, so america had a really bad drought last year and the year before so they're forecasting really um, tight supply mm -hmm. beef towards the end of this year and next year so that affects then where the other big players oh, yeah. send their send right. their meat so America's going to get tight with beef yep because they had to have a huge they, they had quite a big um, cull because they had a drought um, so a lot of the cows went so they're in the process they're in that herd rebuilding phase at the minute and of course if they didn't have cows they didn't have the calves on the ground so they've got less beef but Australia have already done that herd rebuilding so they've, they're in quite a good position, but probably a lot of their stuff will go to America because America could be short. You know, we are such a small player in this that sometimes it it can, sometimes we can kind of fly under the radar and it doesn't matter, but it can affect us hugely. S small player on the beef side of things, uh, certainly, but... Small player in both. Small player in yeah. lamb as well. Like seriously, about 1% of the total world um, production of both beef and lamb. Tiny. Right, okay, what about Europe? Um, us within Europe will be quite. I think we're. I'm not talking about uh, European Union. I just mean as an European yeah, country. Yeah, I think we're one of the the biggest um, sheep producers, at least in Europe. I don't know the figures off the top of my yeah. head, but but yeah, I mean we're we're big there, but in the grand scheme of things, we're we're not big players. You know, we're not a commodity. Well, China's the big the, the the biggest player of all yeah. in terms of sheep numbers, but then yeah. they have they 
are mainly their own domestic. It's one of the things yeah. that China don't export is so yeah. much as is food, uh, uh, unless well, someone can no, tell me if I'm wrong. But oh, really? So, so they, 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 they need demand. demand. I, yeah. I remember here, and so we've got one pig processing um, site in in Scotland at Brechin, um, and somebody said to me if Brechin was running full tilt for the whole year, the Chinese would eat all of that within the f- first three hours of the first of January. I've, I've heard something like that. Oh all all the pigs currently in the UK just now yeah. would only cover the Chinese demand for one day. That's yeah. the story I get told. Yeah. So I mean, all it's, the it's, pigs in the, the UK just now would last one day in yeah. China. It's oh nuts. Oh my goodness. It's nuts. Well, they have like nine, big... nine, twenty, or God, yeah. I'm just making up numbers, but like multi story. Yeah, multi story pig, uh, yeah, pig, pig, pig stag, places. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, it is, it is, and I'd love to go over there and see it actually, because I've heard something about some state run dairy farm where uh, 100,000 yeah. uh, milking cows and all that. But it's like, but it's like, you know, I think we're bad in this country for instantly thinking, oh, it'll be like terrible Awful, conditions. Yeah. It's like I've seen a couple of clips in that from a Nuffield thing. That it's like, it's like slick. I mean, like the manager isn't yeah. even a dairy farmer. He's like a genius um, computer programming business right, manager. Okay. Yeah, like everything's so numbers and figures yeah. and efficiency, and it is it is slick. Like yeah, we can't do a hundred thousand cows without being. No, no, amazing. No, yeah, yeah. Exa- exactly. It'd be a disaster. Exactly. So, like, I'd love to go and see the yeah, kind of yeah. things. Like, incredible. But, but these numbers, they're just they're just nuts, these numbers. I think the other thing I read recently which shocked me was the two biggest, the, the two countries with the most cows in the world are India mm. and Brazil. And India and Brazil together have more cows than all the rest of the world put together. Right. <laughs> I, the, shows my knowledge here. I was just speaking, my accountants are just back from India. They get about. <laughs> uh, do they eat beef in India? No. Well, the, uh, Hindus don't eat beef, I don't think. No, exactly. Really. So, and, and I, I, don't, I don't know. Oh, for milk? Presumably, yeah. I, I, it really it shocked me. I couldn't believe it. But that, I, I've known for a while that India have got the most cows in the world. Brazil, yeah. you'd expect. Oh, yeah. but, uh, is that right, India? Yeah. Yeah. I suppose it's got the most people as well. And, the, and if they the, don't the kill them, they're going to have lots of them, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> <It's> <laughs> sacred. Yeah. If, 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 there's, there's the most people in the world. If India's got one cow for like yeah. sacredness... Yeah, uh, the husku. Yeah, if everyone's <laughs> yeah. if everyone's got a husku, <laughs> exactly, it's gonna be the worst. <laughs> oh, well, that, uh, no, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good. Did. point I also saw a great thing like, talking about you know if they comes hard on us about um, cattle and environment and methane and all that, but someone did a great thing about how actually we're not need to target. They need to stop looking at the UK and having a hard time giving us a hard time because you countries like India where it takes eight dairy cattle. To produce the same, yeah. to be as efficient as one cow yeah. here. Yeah. So they really? ha- they need eight times the cattle mm-hmm. to produce the same amount That's of milk. So it's so much more methane and so much yeah. more inefficient. So rather than yeah. the guy was basically saying the rich countries need to plow money into the poor countries yeah. for for actual change in global mm-hmm. warming and, and things yeah. like methane and a- agriculture. It, like they're, they're hammering us about being more efficient and planting mm-hmm. trees and all the mm-hmm. things they're trying to do to us. Actually, what they need to do is all the elites get together and say, see these countries are the real problem. Mm-hmm. Let's it's, power, yeah, yeah. pile money into them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, is the route. But, uh, see, with um, with land prices being so high at the moment, do you think there is danger of us starting to import from the likes of New Zealand and Australia to bring prices down? So we're exporting, at the moment, the last quarter last year, we exported twice as much as we imported. Um, right, okay. You know, so th- there is, I mean, Easter in particular, Easter's always, I always think Easter's really weird. Why are we encouraging people to eat lamb at Easter? When Last we, time of year. I know, exactly. it's so I've odd. always yeah. thought that was yeah. weird. I don't know where it's come from. Yeah. But there are not enough legs. People want legs of lamb and there are yeah. not enough legs available. So yeah. sometimes, you know, that's when, that's when the imports come in because people want them for specific occasions and they just aren't here, mm-hmm. you know, because we've run out of our hogs by then and we've not really started a new season yet, so... Um, so is that really because that, that's like questions I have is why why are we why are we still importing meat like can we not when we're why are we importing when we're exporting but is it just to cover certain be- things because that's how that's how trade works so well, because different it's cheaper people as well. but different people eat different but, things but why should why is it cheaper so because it's cheaper at the, at source. Do you know what I mean the lambs are sixty pounds in New Zealand but, so yeah. of course they can fly them over here. The other big benefit in New Zealand lamb is they're all the same, and supermarkets love that. You know, like all the lambs are the same from not all, but majority of lambs are the same. You go to a market, you know, you go to Stirling. I talk about it a lot because we sell a lot of lambs there. Like there's eighty different breeds coming through. 
all different shapes and sizes and weights, whereas New, New Zealand, it's like the majority of Romneys are Romney, or Romney a, crosses. Or, New Zealand mm. in particular are, 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 are an export nation. They know how to do it. You know, they've been out there, they've made uh, trade agreements with countries all over the world. They mm -hmm. really know how to do it. When I first started this job, somebody explained to me, and I thought it was just such a brilliant explanation, our sector is exactly the opposite of making cars. So when you're making a car, mm -hmm. you're buying lots of little pieces from all over the world, putting them into one thing and trying to sell that one thing for more than you paid for all the little pieces. Mm -hmm. With the animals, it's, it's the exact opposite. You're taking one beast and you're breaking it down into lots of little pieces and you're trying to sell them all over the place for more than you paid for the beast. And that's what New Zealand in particular have kind of pioneered. Mm -hmm. So somebody told me that an average lamb carcass um, from New Zealand could go to 140 different markets because they'll take each bit and send it to the market that will pay the most for it. So we don't get that's wild. we don't mm. get whole lambs coming over here from New Zealand, right? Okay, you know you get the bits that we want to eat, yeah, um, and they'll send the other bits to other places, and that's how you make money out of that that carcass. So you know we we are not. Um, we don't eat a huge variety of different cuts in this country. We like what we like. Yeah. Um, so, so there's not enough. In our, so we send bits of our lambs that we're not going to eat somewhere else. You know, and okay, we buy in. See, that makes sense to me. Okay. It's called, it's it's carcass balance. So I've been then. Tra trade deals are factors as well. You're, I mean, kudos to New Zealand just saying they're an export nation. Of course, there's only five million of them. Yeah, and, and, yeah and they have to export. Them. Yeah, they have to. But kudos to us a bit as well because we obviously have better trade deals than they do. Yeah. Because, like, France, for example, this, again, yeah, back yeah. to the Scottish, you'll know more about this. 30% of our lambs go to France. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, France is our biggest customer. Yeah. yeah. A huge Muslim population. We yep. talk about it all the time. Like, that is the key for us. Mm -hmm. We are so close to large Muslim populations. Yep. And even here in the UK, yeah. but Europe, especially yeah. France, massive. Uh, Germany, I think, is the next biggest mm -hmm. uh, for us for export. Like, it's, it's, a, it's, it's our golden ticket, really, compared yep. to New Zealand or a fair trek. Like, yes. You know, there yeah. is countries There's within countries reach. countries much closer to them. But, yeah. but in terms of actual, you know, Muslim countries, mm -hmm. we're a lot closer. Yeah. You know, and, and the figures yeah. are, the, the HDB figures for, for Muslim consumption of lamb, I think they said the average, in a week, only 6% of UK households will buy lamb. Right. But 62% of Muslim households in the UK will buy lamb. So they're buying 10 times as much as right. the average wow. household. That's incredible. How does that figure, the 6%, compare to beef? And oh, it's, it's way, way lower. Um, lamb is, it's very much a speciality sort of meat mm -hmm. for us. Um, in Scotland, we only eat half as much per head as they eat in England and a third really? as much as they eat in Wales per head. Well, it's English people eat more lamb than us? English people eat more lamb than us. In Double? Scotland, yeah, people in Scotland just just do not eat lamb. I bet you know why that is. Why is that? Because Scottish people are poorer. Absolutely is. 100%. Well, there is an there is an absolute ceiling price on lamb. How, what speak, about beef? What about beef? England to Scotland? Oh, I couldn't tell you on beef. I think we'll eat just as much as them. It's only the lamb figures that really stood out to mm -hmm. me. You I, know. I think... I think I mean, could, you're could talking... Be. But you're dividing that down. You're not just saying they eat double us, but there's 10 times as many of them. No, that, per that, head. That's per <laughs> head. <laughs> per head. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, and the Welsh eat three times as much. What is that? So lamb as we do. Yeah, Scottish well, people just... that's not just, a money thing then. They just don't eat as much lamb. It's it, not a money Welsh thing, it's a culture thing. Welsh people eat three times as much as Scotland. So how do we change our culture? Well, QMS <sighs> have been trying for 20 years to try and get more Scottish people to eat lamb. And, you know... So what sort of things can QMS... Like, what sort of things would you implement to try that? So I suppose it, it could be a family thing, couldn't it? You know, I was in a... I was in a supermarket a couple of months ago and I got to the checkout with some ingredients and there was a guy there behind the checkout in his, I don't know, 50s? And he's, you know, they do, they chat away to you. What are you making tonight then? And I said, oh, I can't even remember, ta lamb tagine or something like that. And he went, oh, I've never tried lamb. What's it like? And you think... What? And he was in Gala Shields. I mean, he wasn't in the middle of Glasgow or anything, you know, and I was thinking, you're thinking how on earth can you get yeah. to your mid-50s? And it wasn't that he had anything against it. He just, i never tried lamb. So I think if you've not grown up in your house eating lamb, 
they're, you, then you maybe don't know how to cook it, yeah, so you don't it, give it, it to your kids. Come to so the, it just doesn't come to the mm. forefront. I think that's where Australia lamb, with their advertising, now you'll be yeah. well aware of Australia lamb. Oh, absolutely. And I are, wish I had their budget, I are, tell you. I know, but I know, I, I, yeah, <laughs> the, their last advert was huge, like yeah. CGI, yeah. and it, it's yeah. incredible. But they did one that was very low cost, the yeah. one with all the, the religious leaders sitting around the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, it's like, what we're going to eat? Well, it's lamb. I've, I've spoken about yeah. it. Because it's the one thing we all have in common. Every religion yeah. in the world can yeah. eat lamb, which which is incredible. So like that wasn't a big budget. That's just genius. Yeah. And, it and, is. It's and, really good marketing. And, and it's about making it, like, that's clever, but it's funny as well. Yeah. You know, and it's like, humour is the way... Yeah. The, you know, folk are like, but, but they, they lamb folks seem like a laugh. But they eat <laughs> lamb in the first place. That's the thing. It's getting yeah, people who don't eat lamb yeah, to yeah. try it. So, I mean, what we do at a, at a sort of school level is we we recognised oh, a good 10 years ago, even maybe more, that in home economics classes, they didn't have enough schools, didn't have enough budget to actually cook with meat. So, you know, the kids weren't ever getting a chance to cook with meat because the schools couldn't afford it. So we have a voucher scheme that the, every secondary school in Scotland can apply to get a voucher to buy meat. If you apply for the voucher, you then they then get paired up with their local butcher. If the local butcher wants to, you know, make more of that relationship, then we help them with it. They at least get the meat, and it's for cooking in the home economics class, so that they've actually done it once. Yeah, um, yeah that's, you know, because otherwise, if you're if you're a kid who's never seen it at home, never touched the stuff, and you're you're getting into your twenties, are you going to go out and? Try it if you've never done it before. People worry about cooking ra- lamb wrongly as well. I think people just don't really know about what to do with it. So you know, we've can, got can you h- cook hundreds lamb of recipes wrongly? It's a red meat. Look, I know, but people get really you can really go wrong. It's but it is quite expensive. You're right. Butchers will tell you that there is an absolute ceiling price in lamb, and if it goes above that, they just don't sell it. Yeah, oh yeah, we've, an absolute, we've spoken about in that a way that in here. doesn't really happen with beef. Beef isn't as bad, but butchers will say lamb. There's a certain amount. Go above that, you won't sell it. So I suppose with beef, a big thing is you can. It's a lot easier to change cut sizes, like a fillet, yeah, for example. That's true. It's a lot easier to make yeah. your fillets narrower and keep the price the same, but just a bit less meat. It's mm-hmm. maybe not as easy with lamb. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Because a leg's mm-hmm. a leg, and yeah. a, a, a yeah. chop's a chop. It's, and that's why European a lot of the markets like these forty kilo lambs, forty two kilo lighter lambs, because they can keep this the yeah. cut smaller, and, yeah. and certainly supermarkets like the light lambs for for that reason yeah. as well. Um, but yeah, it's. It, do you know? I, I just wonder about do you guys like. What do you talk about in the office? Like, but you kind of be getting a hard time. Like the gaffer kind of be like, oh god, lamb, lamb and beef prices. What, what we're gonna do? <laughs> do you sit about going, take the week off? What's the point? <laughs> what do you know what I mean? I like, what, how, how, what's your objective? So just to increase consumption, not. Yeah. So developing new markets is a big one. Right. Okay. So for lamb in particular, you know, you've got this Muslim population around the world that want to eat it so i heard you on one of your other po- podcasts talking about the middle east yeah because the first minister had said um about having some out in dubai and how they'd liked it and you said we won't get it there because they only import live yeah not true okay so you tell me that something was said in this podcast that wasn't factually mm, correct this is a first Unbuck- <laughs> this <laughs> is unprecedented <laughs> Unbuck- yeah, if you say anything with confidence on here don't believe it <laughs> um, no, that's interesting. Right? I thought it, so. Yeah, is so, that a recent thing, or has that so always been the case? That's. I think that's always been the case. But the the complicated part of it all is that um, processors, abattoirs, have to be accredited. So obviously, the big thing about the Middle East Muslims halal. It needs to be halal. In Scotland, um, we, it, the legislation is that you can't have non-stunned halal. So any halal that's done here has to be stunned. Um, so do you want me to explain about that or not? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Better explain that. Yeah. yeah. For some people. Yeah. So, what part of um, the Muslim culture is that the uh, and for for actually really sensible reasons and the you know when they when they made this law was that you shouldn't eat something that you found dead, you know you shouldn't eat something that you found dead lying about because you could get a disease from it. I mean, it's really it's very straightforward. So that's why halal was made. Yeah. So okay. they. Our own part of their religion and their and their laws is they're only allowed to eat an animal that um could that is alive when they alive when they kill it if that makes any sense. Okay. Yep. So if you um stun an animal with a captive bowl, it can't be revived. Yep. Um, if you do it, you can do it with sheep with um electrocution, and they could be they could be revived. So therefore, that covers the bases. 
Um, right, for the religion. Good job you did explain it because I didn't know that. No, you know, I and it actually, I thought stunned was stunned, but it, right, okay. it makes really good sense. You know, in, however long, you know, fifteen hundred years ago, whatever it was that these laws were written to say, don't go and eat something that's lying dead because you might get something from it. It's a really good basis for the for the law. But you know, fast forward to today, it's it's about that technical difference between how you stun an animal. So you have to be accredited to do that and you have to be accredited specially to export it. So each processor has to go through an audit and process. Um, they have to have people come and examine, make sure they're doing it all right. There are other parts involved in, in Halal mm. that the, the stun box has to be a certain um, certain angle. They, there has to be an imam there who's saying a prayer. You know, there's, it's, not, it's not just that, but that's part of it. So... Very, very recently, just in the past two or three months, the first um, abattoir in Scotland has become accredited to export halal Scotch lamb, stunned halal Scotch lamb, because we're not allowed to do anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we've been out. Uh, so it was us that took that Scotch lamb out to Dubai for the First Minister's dinner. We, it's, wasn't, it was QMS that organised it. Obviously, yeah. it, the processor... it's their lamb. Well, but the, we organised getting it out there. The interesting thing was uh, the lamb was from Ayrshire. As well, yeah. yeah. Do we know can't, where? I can't say any more than that. Why? Uh, I've been told it's top secret, but Why? It, uh, for various reasons, uh, mainly to raise mysti mysterious. Okay, uh, you I like make it. it make, raise yeah. intrigue. <laughs> I like <laughs> it. But yeah, I, I know whose lamb it was, <gasps> yeah. uh, and it was it was lamb from Ayrshire. Oh, very good. We well, go. and as you heard the first minister say, the you know they really liked it out there. So that was the very very first Scotch lamb that went out there because it's the first time we've been been able to do that. But since then, um, Tom and our team has been out to a big trade show called Gulf Foods uh, with the processor who's got the accreditation to try and get out there and find more, um, you know, find people who want to, to buy it. So that dinner, there was there was chefs and things there as well. Um, there was part members of our team and others there speaking to them about all the benefits of buying Scotch lamb and how good it was and, and, and all that sort of thing. So it's, a, it's, it's literally just the door starting to open but it could be a huge market huge. if we can get yeah. into yeah. Um, really, really exciting stuff, actually. And now that one processor's done it, it might well be that the or others see the benefit and they go through. Because, you know, these pro these audits are, are pretty onerous. You know, they have people there for a week watching everything they're doing, writing it all down. Oh, you know? Once you get yeah. your foot in the door there and you, the first person's on it, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's an impressive market. You mm, sell the story, yeah. Scotch lamb, you know. Every, we, are for, we are fortunate here that... Yep. <laughs> Not that England has a bad reputation, but there's certainly more affection around the world, you could probably say, towards Scottish people and, and I, your Celtic nations yeah. than there is to, you know, yeah. perhaps the, the label British. Yes. Uh, you know, British well, England suggests don't have, colonialism. Yeah. And, and, and England don't have a have a, a brand themselves. There's no, they don't really sell English lamb. You sell Scotch lamb and Welsh lamb. But yeah, England don't. They so where do, do they sell lamb? Just, they just do uh, British, I think. They don't have an English Brand. Right, that's interesting. Mm. So Scotch lamb and, and Welsh lamb are both PGIs, are both protected geographical indicators. So it's really really well sort of regulated. Scotch lamb has to be part of a, of the farm assurance schemes, and it has to be born, reared, and uh, slaughtered in Scotland. So it's you know and Wales will be the same. Yeah, Welsh lamb will be the same. Welsh lambs is slightly different in that when they when they got the PGI, there weren't any Welsh abattoirs that killed lambs so you, they can actually slaughter them in england okay um we can't we they have to be slaughtered it's here. part yeah. of our pgi that they have to be slaughtered here but so there'll be more sheep in scotland than, than there are in england anyway i would think so yeah yeah there must be yeah aye we're a big sheep country yeah yeah and i and uh, i mean i hope there's not too many welsh people listening to this because if they find out what you can get for your lambs if you export them they might stop eating them all <laughs> guys see if you just stop eating them that's why I, that's actually the reason Scottish people don't eat them they're so bloody tight we're like I'm not eating this could send it to France <laughs> well you're laughing you know but I met a guy from New Zealand you love mince again tonight <laughs> <laughs> he was telling me that um, New Zealand produced the best kiwi fruits in the world you'd imagine that you know they produce top quality kiwi fruits and they export 100% of them and they buy 100%. in 100%. They export all their top kiwi fruit and they buy in inferior ki kiwi fruit for their own people to eat because that's all they want to pay for. Interesting. I cannot <laughs> believe that. Well, I actually just can't believe that kiwi fruit comes from New Zealand. <laughs> what? Well, that just seems too obvious to me. <laughs> like, I assumed it was something else to do with kiwi, like 
uh, the Kiwi bird dish, but then that's maybe well, it's well, that's not New Zealand as well. Isn't you say that, but nothing's New Zealand. Like New Zealand never didn't have any uh, mammals on it. I know it's a kind of bird, I suppose, but it's still did it anywhere. Yeah, it did. Where do you think mammals well, came from? Do you think we just created them no, in a lab? But think about back when we were all Pangea, we were all joined together. No, but well, that's part of the thing. But that's the interesting thing about New Zealand. It, it did not have any mammals or uh, it had birds, but it, yeah. it, I don't even know if it did have birds. It had birds, yeah. Right, so yeah. all it had when when man first went there was was birds, and maybe the Ma the Maori lads were already there, probably. I'm guessing because they're indigenous. So no, they're not. They no, they went there from. They know when they got there. I think I'm sure I've read somewhere that they came from, um, the, like like the, the Pacific South Islands. Pacific Islands. Yeah, they okay. moved across there. I think they so know the time when they New got Zealand there. had nothing. Yeah. There was nothing there, I don't yeah. think. I, I knew they'd no animals, so every animal in New Zealand has has been brought there. By by man, as opposed to, you know, they've all lived in harmony, you know. Right, okay. That is interesting. Yeah. So I wonder where the kiwi I I, I just thought about kiwi fruits. Have then. you tried golden kiwis? Is that a well, tan like. suffer dude? Because <laughs> uh, if if it is, I have not. I don't know what are they like. <laughs> John, turn down for f come back in five minutes. Uh, what, what is a golden kiwi? A type of fruit, I take it. Yeah, it's just a kiwi, but it's not got as furry a skin as hairy a skin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wax. A wax bronze kiwi. Sounds delicious. Uh, so we, we, we've talked a bit about lamb and, uh, and hot kiwis. What about the, the beef side of things? So the price is... is about uh, almost as high as it's ever been at the moment for, for dead weight. I think the figure I got last week was something about um, five pound and five pence per kilo is the average, which is dead weight, you know, dead weight, yep. which is, is pretty good. Um, we get more generally than they get in England. Uh, they talk about the Scotch premium. Oh, you'll love this. Uh, yeah, go and tell us. Uh, yes. You got a hard time for that, do you not? Well, it's been there historically, and uh, a couple of years ago, for about two weeks, we were getting about the same as we were getting in England, and everybody seems to think it's still like that. But last week, I think we we're getting about thirteen pence a kilo more okay. than they are in England on so, average. That's so we are not getting every... the Scotch premium. We are, we absolutely are. It goes up and down, um, and I was actually looking back historically, and even twenty years ago, it, it varied between five pence a kilo and twenty pence a kilo. It goes up and down depending on supply and demand. The reason it dropped. Two years ago was because of calving patterns, really, because the English saw how their policy was changing and a lot of people put off cows. So they had less calves, so they had a smaller pool, supply and demand. Mm -hmm. We had quite a lot here. Um, so there were people fighting over the cattle in England and paying more for them. Supply and demand. You know, of so that's... And, and supply and demand is actually a factor in the lamb trade this year as well yep, because absolutely. England, we spoke they about had droughts. A pool yep. England had a hell of a drought. Yep. Not last year, the year before. Yep. Um, which, yeah, the year before. Yeah, their scanning before, percentages last year were down. Yeah, there was no flush at all for the yeah. owls. They were lean as hell. There was no keep for them. Even in the summer, there was no keep. Yeah. And and scanning was a disaster, yeah. you know, back 40, 50% a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And that's a knock-on effect. And now what we're seeing is a Smallenburg. Yep. It's potentially going to have the same effect into next year. Um, so look, we are. There's definitely Scotland is definitely getting the lucky side of things this last couple of years in terms of weather. Touch wood. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> touch wood in terms yeah. of weather in terms of this bloody yeah. Schmollenberg and blue tongue. The other panic as well if it comes across now. Yeah. So so and it's ironic because we're like famed as the home of the midges. <laughs> but as I've said before, yeah. when I was down in Devon at Christmas uh, scanning Lizzie's mum's sheep. I was getting eaten alive by midges. Yeah. I just didn't realise that was a thing. Yeah. No, no, yeah. Neither, neither did that really until this blue tongue I mean, was talking Because about. we're slightly colder up here, and I suppose this might change as the climate changes, but because we're slightly colder up here and we're tupping slightly later, you're not getting, you've not got the same risk because a lot of the midges have gone by the time yeah. we're putting the tops out. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas down there, if you're putting tops out in August, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. It's, yeah. There's no fly strike going about. <laughs> it's a nightmare. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. And, and I, I get put a, a good question. We're, oh jeez, I know it's. I know in ten minutes. It's great chat, this so yeah, great chat. Um, I, I have to put a question to you though before we we wrap up. This has been fantastic stuff, by the way. This <laughs> is oh, our podcasts are getting so good. If I do say so, I'm, the chat is just so good. Like, <laughs> and I, I'm just learning so much. I know other people will be as well. And and we're going to say it. I'm, I'm not wrapping up here, but like Kate is good at explaining things and talking. Excellent, excellent. You're in a good. You're good at. <laughs> 
I, I don't think well, there'll be many folk that, no matter what they say about QMS, I don't think there'll be many folk that say that you're not good at your job. It's a yeah. skill you learn as a vet because you learn you learn all this vet talk yep. when you're a vet, but you also have to learn how to translate that into something that people can understand. And talk to farmers. You know yeah. how to talk to farmers. Absolutely. And you are a farmer. Yeah, I know. Well, that's, I know. That, that is the ultimate to farmers. You know, yeah. as soon as the a farmer... The credibility. Yeah. It's, it's shocking, but as soon as a farmer yeah. hears, you're a farmer. Yeah. And again... Yeah. Learn that, learn that as a vet. You know, when we're out seeing practice, one guy—I remember one guy said to me, "Always make that connection first. Yeah. So every time I went onto a new farm, you know, you'd introduce yourself and you'd say some like, you know, oh, oh, we've got that crush at home, or, you know, oh, we've, yeah. you know, oh, see, you've got, see, you've got Texels. We don't have Texels. We've got Suffolk. You know, mm. yeah, that, that sort of changes thing. the way they react. And they then, it, immediately people realise that you're one of our tribe and yeah. they treat you slightly differently. So it's really, really important to make that connection. And I do absolutely understand, you know, we often get comments about QMS in the Rivalry Tower. Well, I was out, we, we were scanning the cattle a couple of months ago, and I mean, we've got our crushes outside, it was pissing and rain, I was covered in muck and shit and all sorts. And I said to, I said to Ed, I wish all, I wish all these people could see me in my Ivory Tower here, you mm -hmm. know, it's just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because I am out there in the ground. Yeah. And stuff so yeah. and, oh, and, and a lot of the team are the same you come across very well and I take it the way Lamtree is now it'll be a golden plated tower you'll be upgraded from <laughs> ivory surely like my <laughs> god you're, <laughs> not, you're not still in that bloody ivory tower are you <laughs> I bought myself a crown and everything. <laughs> oh, it's the, it's the Cuban cigars this week, guys. Come on. <laughs> We've got a Zoom meeting in a fortnight. Just chill. Uh, no, I'm sure not. I oh, don't worry about a marketing campaign. Never mind that. You've seen the price of lambs. Uh, no, uh, but a point I wanted to put to you, though, I got a, I got a voice a bit. Well, uh, my big mate in Orkney, Sean, the Viking. Yes. Yeah, everybody knows, of course. Um, <laughs> it, it, we'd, it, we'd do a bit of back and forth. Uh, he loves a voice note. And he, he sent a really good one, but I can't play it because he, he, he loves a sweary <laughs> word as well. Uh, but he, he wanted to put the point across to yourself, uh, or to ask the question, not uh -huh. to put the point across, to ask the question about the grading system. Yep. Because he's of the opinion that it's, it's all wrong. Uh, in terms of, certainly in the cattle side of things. Sheep, yep. I think, uh, you could argue sheep as well, but in the cattle side of things, Mm -hmm. That we're pushing. Now, I'm trying to remember how you put it across. I know nothing about the grading system. <laughs> well, I know the grain, the the, the euro it's, system, yeah, but yeah. for cattle, yeah. he's saying that it's pushing these harder finishing types, bigger cuts of meat. That actually the consumer, he was talking about, he'd had a steak that was off. Yeah, yeah. Really high graded steak. Yep. But actually, a, a steak off a native bred uh -huh. cattle was far. A beast was far better. So. So why aren't we going for taste? We, we, we get we this for... a lot. People say the Europe grid isn't fit for purpose. And it is fit for the purpose it was designed for. And that is not eating quality. So it it, it was designed to, to pay on meat yield. And that's what it does. So yeah. it, it is fit for that purpose. The question is whether that's the purpose we want. So there's been a lot of work done in the past on meat eating quality. And there are other countries that, that do it differently from us and um, they've been doing it for longer than us but recently it's kind of come up the agenda again you know people have always talked about it but it's, it's come up the agenda a bit and we released a report which is on the website if anybody wants to go and have a look into meeting quality last year so we, we we pulled together all the sort of facts on it so our entire industry development team are now focused on on moving forward with this meeting quality. And what we've done is we've broken it down into, into three sort of parts. There's the stuff you can do right now, the stuff that's a bit more medium term and the, and the longer term stuff. So what the report identified is that there is actually a lot of stuff that we can be doing on farms as farmers that improve meeting quality. You know, it's about feeding, it's about genetics. I'm not going to say about, it's about breeds because it's not about breeds. You know, all breeds are different and you can get good and bad within breeds. Um, it's about how you handle them. It's about disease. Um, it's about how the the hollier drives to the slaughterhouse. You know, there's loads and loads of different factors. There's not a single silver bullet, but there's lots of different things that we can we can all do better um, to improve the meeting quality. So uh, we've got a we run a couple of um, workshops. We run a meet the market workshop, which is taken. Um, people who finish either either lambs or, or cattle, to an abattoir. Mm. 
letting them see them live, letting them see them dead, having the the abattoir people talk to them about what's good and what's bad and, you know, all this sort of thing. Because you'd be amazed at how many farmers haven't actually been in an abattoir, you know. Mm. So it's sort of shown them that stuff. We've also identified that there's a, particularly in cattle, there's a real lack of communication along the supply chain. So often, I mean, we're store producers. We don't have many conversations with the people, finishers who are buying our cattle. There's a real lack of communication there. And if, if they want a certain kind of cattle produced for them, the finishers, they have to tell us when we're out buying a new bull because we need to buy what suits them. So there's we do meet the finisher as well. So that's sort of bridging that gap. There's then the more sort of medium term bit, which is the kind of sexier bit that everybody talks about. And that's to try and find a, a cheap, a easy and quick way of quantifying the quality of meat in a processor. So what it... What it would probably consist of would be some sort of shear test to to see what the tenderness was and or some sort of marbling. Um, in America, what they do is they look visually, look at each um, carcass to, to grade it on its marbling, mm-hmm. you know. So there would be something like that. It's got to be quick and easy because if it, it the processors are working in such tight margins and on such quick lines that they don't want to be stopping the line for to do things. So it's yep. got to fit in with what they do or else they just won't do it. So that's the sort of medium term. You're talking maybe in the ne- hopefully in the next three or four years coming up with something that could be slotted into processors. But again, we can't mandate any of this. This depends on them taking it up, you know. Okay. And then the more longer term is to have a conversation about the Europe grid and how it evolves. And that's not just about us because it's it's UK wide. So that would be ha- something that we'd have to discuss as a as a whole UK nation. And who knows where we're going to be, but if we move away from that and we're no longer longer aligned with Europe, who knows politically how that would go down. You know, the Scottish government has our exports. Well, it could do. And also the Scottish government at the minute have said they want to align with Europe as much as possible because their ambition is to become independent and go back into Europe. So, you know, you've got a lot of competing mm. issues there. Um I don't think it's a bad thing keeping Europe on side, like uh, and even letting Europe we could do with a veterinary agreement with Europe. It would save such a lot of hassle. It would save such a lot of hassle. In, in terms of what? It, oh, oh, export certificates. Is that right? The amount of money, extra money that's had to be spent since we left for vets to sign export certificates so that meat can go across the channel. Really? It's unbelievable. A billions, billions and billions of pounds. And I mean, a lot of our, a lot of our smaller um, processors who used to export have stopped because they just can't do it. Because they're having to pay a vet full time. Yeah, well, the bigger ones, they can have somebody who does that. I full time. That's their job. Yeah. Yeah. Not not necessarily the vet, but they organise it all and and they can fill a lorry and it's all their stuff and there's the risk has decreased. They used to do something called groupage for smaller consignments. So, you know, you'd maybe take you'd have a lorry that would take meat from three or four different processors. Uh-huh. But they stopped that completely. Because it was too much of a risk. Because if there was one little thing wrong with one of those bin. consignments, the whole lot went in the bin. Mm. So we've just made it so much more difficult for ourselves. And if we had a... But have we made it more difficult or Europe's made it more difficult for us? Europe are applying the rules that we helped make. Okay. Mm. We knew those rules were there. Okay. When we left. So we made those rules for other people and bring it into the European yes. Union. And then we left the European yes. Union. Yes. <laughs> so we can hardly say. <clears throat> yeah, mm-hmm. I understand. You know, I don't want to be political, but we can hardly say, well, we didn't know about this because we were there when we were making these rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we knew this was going to come in. Um, so, yeah, there's been a lot of extra cost added. And if there was some sort of veterinary agreement or some sort of redo of the deal, and I'm not saying go back into Europe, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying in political, that's, that's but if done, we made yeah. it easier to, mm-hmm. to export. Um, it would, yeah, it, it would make a huge difference because all they're having to suck up all those costs. Yeah, um, the people well, that are saying out. Well, hopefully that that will come at some point. I mean, we've seen them easing and 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 negotiating a bit with Northern Ireland yeah. to to, yeah. to get them back in Stormont. So, you know, well, who knows what's going to happen in the next year or so politically? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, there's a lot on the horizon. But yeah. I, I appreciate we've, we've kept you along. You've got a fair drive home. You're fine. Yeah, it, Absolutely it, fine. It's getting late. It's been really interesting. <laughs> I, I, we touched on that there about the meat. Uh, and, and Sean did say a, a really interesting thing that... Well, it wasn't interesting. Sean doesn't say any interesting <laughs> things, but... <laughs> nah, he made quite a good point that if something's tasty, folk will buy it again and again and no worry so much about the price. Mm-hmm. You know, if some, if they're like, wow. Yeah. 
Like folk yeah. with Wagyu beef. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like they just expect it to be expensive yeah. because it tastes it's, so yeah. good. And he's saying, you know, if we could get beef, start mm -hmm. start breeding our beef towards the taste, the consumer yep. won't care about the price and if within you, reason. And if you were getting rewarded at, at a processor level for that, then that that sends a message right down the whole chain. Yeah. So yeah, it's finding it's finding the mechanism that that works without it costing a fortune. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because people talk about there's a there's a a system in Australia called MSA, and people That's often okay. talk about that as as the, as the ideal, and it is a really really good system, but it's been running for twenty five years, and every farmer that uses it has to pay a membership into it. So it's not as if it's yeah it just yeah. happened, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're working towards at the minute, and we would hope medium term that there could be something in place with that. Interesting, lots in the pipeline, and uh, you know, you guys, uh, a joke, but he's in a good spot now because you know things are going well. Like the export markets that you've that we have, yeah, are it, strong. Final, final thing, definitely, it's just clicked to me. We we'll say about England eating so much more lamb than Scotland. Again, it comes back to the Muslim population. Yep, yep, probably. Of course, I've just I don't know where Wales comes into that. Oh, though. Yeah. But, 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 I don't you know. No, Wales yeah. will just be. I think Wales will just They've be just a Welsh sheep. Historically, yeah. Eat I mean, well, yeah. Wales and, and, yeah. and sheep farming are so tightly linked. You know, yeah. you'd argue Scotch beef comes to folks' minds before yes. Scotch lamb. Yes. Whereas Welsh Wales, lamb, I yeah. would, I would say, and, is, yeah. is, is is the forefront. It's their. And and we were over we were over in Japan before COVID, and it was to. To, because we were allowed back in after BSE. It was 25 years British beef had not been in Japan. And we went over there and there were importers there who were wanting Scotch beef. They really? they knew Scotch beef was really high quality. They were coming looking for it. You know, British was good, but they wanted Scotch beef. Brilliant. So, good way know. to end it. Okay, yeah. that's honestly been a, a fantastic <laughs> chat. We, we could sit here for two hours. Sort of <laughs> totally. like, we're we're, we're, we're I know. way, way over the hour mark. <laughs> uh, it's been an absolutely fantastic chat. Thanks no for problem. coming across to see us. And uh, yeah, look forward to what QMS can do for us in the future. Thank you very much for having me. And we're done for another weekly interview. How was that for you, Iona? I really, really enjoyed it. I felt like I learned so much and... I went into it, not because I didn't know Kate, I didn't know any background, I didn't really know what route it was going to take, but I came away feeling I'd learned a lot about her as a person, interesting story, and also about the meat industry. Yeah, she's class, Kate. I think she's she's ideal for that role because mm -hmm. she's so likeable as well. Yeah. And, you know, she's lived a life. Like, she's she's obviously very intelligent. She, a, mm -hmm. she was a vet. I suppose, I suppose you're always a vet. Once you're a vet, you're always a vet. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and she's a farmer in her own right as well. She's got credibility. Yeah, she's perfect. For, and, and I think anyone watching that would, would, would struggle not to warm to her. Mm -hmm. You know, she's quite open and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, she, it was just a great interview. So thanks very much to Kate for coming in. Thanks for explaining why, you know, lambs lambs are only £3.80 a kilo. Yep. Disgrace. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, levies have... Uh, since recording that, the levies have went up. Uh, or it's been announced, I don't think at the time of recording that, which a couple of weeks ago mm. it wasn't announced, but it's now since been announced that the levies are slightly going up. Yeah, I think it was long overdue for a, a wee boost, so yeah. good on them. They deserve it. They, they deserve it. Whatever they're doing is working. And we're not sponsored by QMS in <laughs> any way. I'm not even farm assured. Are you not? No. Your dad will be farm assured, though, eh? No, I don't think so. I will be. Will he? How do you know if you're farm assured? Hey, we, we your dad, we obviously <laughs> pay a fee every year and you get a visit oh, yeah, and no, inspection every year. No, I don't think so. No? Don't think so. Okay. That's uh, maybe not. He's only sheep, so he wouldn't really need to be. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Anyway, that's it for this one. Thanks to our sponsors, Chris Lex and Animax. We, I need to get back and check on a couple of hungry lambs. You need to go back and Rescue Dad. Rescue Dad, yep. Give him a, just a reassuring things will be okay. A wee a wee arm round the shoulder. It might get better. <laughs> But then again, it might not. <laughs> That's us for this one, folks. Uh, keep going strong at lambing. And I always uh, give a shout out this time of year. Remember, if you do need to speak to someone, we have RSABI and RABI. Give the helpline a phone and see if just the chat's nonsense to somebody for a bit and get it off your chest. Give them a phone. We'll put the number on the screen there for anyone watching. I don't know off by heart to read it out, but you can easily Google it. And uh, that's us for this one. We'll see you next week for another one. Keep your chins up. I've been Cami. I've been Iona. And we are both... Fed by, by farmers. farmers.